This is a Reconstructionist Radio production. Please visit GaryNorth.com slash free books for a free downloadable copy in PDF form of this book. Productive Christians in an Age of Guilt Manipulators, A Biblical Response to Ronald J. Sider by David Chilton, published by Institute for Christian Economics, Tyler, Texas, copyright 1981. Chapter 12, The Goal of Equality. Does the need for privacy and space make it right for one family to occupy a house that could easily meet the needs of 10 or 15 people? Ronald Sider, Living More Simply for Evangelism and Justice, page 18. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, throw in your lot with us, we shall all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your feet far from their path, for their feet run to evil, and they hasten to shed blood. Proverbs 1, 10 through 16. There are three dangers we face in reading the works of Ronald Sider, especially when he says something that closely approximates biblical truth. First, we can fall into the trap of thinking he actually means what he says. Careful attention must be paid to the real focus of his thought, which is too often in opposition to his claims. Second, a casual reading might cause us to swallow the unbiblical ideas which he tends to fuse with the teachings of Scripture. And third, we can make the mistake of rejecting those things which are true, simply because cider is usually so objectionable. Does the Bible command economic equality? Cider says it does, and that since God disapproves of great extremes of wealth and poverty, he created mechanisms and structures to prevent great economic inequality among people. One of these equalizing mechanisms is the jubilee examined in the Last chapter. God's word certainly tells us to care for the poor, as we have already seen. Even our enemies are to be given aid in distress, Proverbs twenty five, twenty one and twenty two. More particularly, Christian brothers and sisters who are needy should be helped out of our supply. For example, first John three, sixteen through eighteen. This in fact is is the very meaning of Christian fellowship and communion. Both words are translations of koinonia, as Sider points out very well. For example, in Paul's description of the body life of the Christian assembly in Romans chapter 12, he tells us that we should be contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Verse 13. The word contributing there is the verb form of koinonia. In other words, if we are to have genuine fellowship in the body of believers, we must not be content with coffee and donuts on Sunday morning. We must be fellowshipping to the needs of the saints, truly seeking to help them in their difficulties. The primary symbol of this sharing ministry among believers is the communion service, which in modern churches has been almost entirely stripped of its meaning. Far from being the pre meal of congregations today, the communion service of the New Testament was the continuation and fulfillment of the Old Testament festivals. See, for example, Matthew twenty-six nineteen through 30 and 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. It was a love feast, a, commu- a common meal in which the Christians shared their food with one another. The participants did not get a little piece of cracker and a th- thimble full of grape juice. They sat down and ate a meal together. The danger Paul rebuked at Corinth was that the believers there were failing to discern the Lord's body. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine. 
This doesn't mean they fail to comprehend some mystical dogma regarding the precise relationship of Christ's physical body to the bread and the wine. Paul was not rebuking a lack of intellectual understanding, but rather a lack of moral discernment. The Corinthians had been behaving sinfully, indulging themselves in gluttony and drunkenness, refusing to share their food with one another. Verse 21. The body they failed to discern was Christ's congregational body, their fellow believers. They came to have communion and did not commune together. They did not share, yet they called it a sharing service. Paul accused them of not eating the Lord's Supper, that each one ate his own supper. Verse 20 and 21 with the result being that one is hungry while another is drunk. And this is a problem with churches today. Even though we've gotten rid of the alcohol in most cases, incidentally, we're supposed to share the wine, not abolish it. In many modern communion services, the participants receive a token meal, close their eyes and chew away, thinking spiritual inward type thoughts, in total isolation from their neighbors. That's what the good ones are doing anyway. Others of us are contemplating other sublime mysteries, what to do about the piece of wafer stuck in their throats and how sour the grape juice is, but the service contributing to our mutual appreciation and loving relationship with each other as a body. Not usually and not at all in the biblical sense of having the regular opportunity of sharing food with one another. And even the full communion service, which should be restored, is itself merely an emblem of what we are at all times, what we are at all times, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. 1 Corinthians ten seventeen. We should always be available to fellow believers as members of one body, one family in Christ. James states this in strong terms. What use is it, my brethren, if a man says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. James two fourteen through 17 We should do what we can to meet the needs of our fellow Christians who are truly in need. Does this mean equalizing our wealth? Cider says yes on the basis of Second Corinthians eight thirteen through 15 where Paul requests the church at Corinth to give financial assistance to the needy Christians in Jerusalem. For this is not for the case for the ease of others and for your affliction, but by way of equality at the present time your abundance being a supply for their want, that their abundance also may become a supply for your want, that there may be equality as it is written he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little had no lack. Paul is not speaking here of complete redistribution of income, but rather of voluntarily meeting the needs of the poor Jerusalem believers by the more well-to-do Corinthians. Cider tells us that the norm is something like economic equality among the people of God and that God desires major movement toward economic equality in the new society of the church. This is a distortion. Paul is not asking that income be equalized, that Christians should pool all their stocks and bonds and income-producing pro property and businesses and redistribute them equally. The word for equality occurs one other time in the New Testament where Paul commands 
Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness. Colossians 4, verse 1. This is not a demand for equal income between masters and their slaves. Paul is simply repeating the biblical mandate that a responsible owner's slave should receive the necessities of life. The equality intended by Paul in 2 Corinthians is simply that Christians should try to meet the needs of destitute members of the body of Christ, giving them what is necessary for their body. James 2.16 Paul's mention of the gathering of manna by the migrant community of Israel in the wilderness does not constitute sumptuary legislation for all Christians for all time. The point of the quotation is to stress the ideal of even the poorest members of the congregation having sufficient food. The equality refers to provision for actual needs. We must not confuse the modern socialist notion with Paul's statement. In the specific sense of the Greek term, a wealthy master and his slave are equal if they both have enough to eat. Even though the actual possessions of the master may be vastly disproportionate to those of the slave. The Bible requires me to help those in need of food and clothing, but this is a far cry from Sider's international egalitarianism. Sider gives two New Testament examples of what he regards as equalizing. Jesus' practice of sharing a common purse with his disciples. John 12, verse 6 and 13, 29. And the communism of the early Christians in the church in Jerusalem. Acts 2, 44 through 46 and 4, 32 through 37. <coughs> Concerning the practice of Jesus and his disciples... It may be readily admitted that a small band of itinerant full-time missionaries <coughs> who are constantly living together and have, have no place of permanent residence, Matthew 8.20, would probably find this to be an efficient method of operating. But it was a very special circumstance for a limited time and should not be considered normative for most Christians. Since Sider has not yet suggested that all Christians take up a nomadic existence as traveling preachers, we need not detain ourselves with this example any further. The second example is the famous one. It has been used as a proof text by Christian socialists for centuries. Yes, the early Jerusalem church practiced financial sharing. No, it is not normative for all Christians. The situation was this. On the day of Pentecost, when Jews from around the Roman Empire had gathered in Jerusalem, Peter preached a sermon which immediately added 3,000 new believers to the early church. Acts 2.41 Shortly thereafter, 5,000 more were converted. Acts 4.4 4. Because of the urgent necessity of receiving instruction in the faith, most, if not all, of these new converts stayed in Jerusalem, 2, verse 41 through 42. They had brought enough with them for their stay during the feast, but they had not planned on staying in Jerusalem indefinitely. Nevertheless, there they were, and the early church was faced with the immediate economic crisis of gigantic proportions. God commands aid to needy brethren and the Jerusalem Christians stepped in to supply for their needs. Many of the needy were apparently from Israel, but many also were Hellenized Jews from other nations. Acts 2, 9 through 11 and 6 verse 1. <coughs> it was a special situation and required special measures to deal with. So believers in Jerusalem who owned property liquidated it as the need arose using the proceeds for charity. In addition, Jerusalem was condemned property anyway because Jesus had promised to destroy it in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. And the Christians knew they would have to prepare to leave when the Romans surrounded it. They sold knowingly 
to Jews who would lose everything in the city. In short, tough luck for the rebellious, crucifying Jews of that generation. God's new people used inside information about the future to rip off the Jews. <clears throat> As with the example of Jesus and his disciples, <coughs> Cider's Jerusalem model is no model at all. It was a special tactic designed to meet unique circumstances. And obviously, if all Christians were to simply liquidate all their capital and redistribute it for the immediate consumption, there would soon be nothing left. Selling property can continue only so long as there remains property to sell and buyers with assets to exchange. <coughs> Certainly, the example of these early Christians rebukes our indifference and unwillingness to help needy brothers and sisters around us. But it does not demand that we do what they did, unless we get a load of 8,000 jobless Christian immigrants dumped in our community too. And even then, capital consumptions should be a last resort. We will also need rich non-believers to sell to, economically productive people who can put our capital to good use. <coughs> Cider's reasons for wanting Christians to practice economic equality are not really related to the church. His goal is to use Christians to appeal for governmentally enforced economic equality, and he feels that the demand for this would be more credible if the church were to observe it as an example. This is the basis for everything he is demanding from the church. It is all a means to his very political ends. <coughs> this can be seen in the title of his article, Sharing the Wealth, the Church as Biblical Model for Public Policy. He sees the church as the most universal body in the world today, Thus, if he can control the church, he will be well on his way to controlling the world. Here is his reasoning. To ask government to legislate what the church cannot persuade its members to live is a tragic absurdity. Only as groups of believers in North America and Europe dare to incarnate in their life together what the Bible teaches about economic relationships among the people of God do they have any right to demand that leaders in Washington or Westminster shape a new world economic order? Only if the body of Christ is already beginning to live a radically new model of economic sharing will our demand for political change have integrity and impact. Now contrast that with his statement that economic sharing among Christians, the means to his goal of centralized power, is to be voluntary and that legalism is not the answer. Not that is until it is legislated. Then armed officers will come to collect our donations and the text exegeted as the basis for it will come from the federal register. If you think Cider was simply outlining a plan for a wonderful paradise of voluntary sharing among Christians, you've been conned. He has no intention of stopping with voluntarism. He wants to manipulate the church with envy and guilt to provide a model for public policy and later, when his proposals are enacted into laws, voluntarism be damned. You will share, whether you like it or not. Again, he says, certainly we should work politically to demand costly concessions from Washington in international forums working to reshape the International Monetary Fund, as well as new policy and trade negotiations on tariffs, commodity agreements, and the like. Certainly we must ask whether far more sweeping structural changes are necessary. Far more sweeping structural changes are necessary. However, our attempt to restructure secular society will possess integrity only if our personal lifestyles demonstrate that we are already daring to live what we ask Washington to legislate. If even one quarter of the Christians in the Northern Hemisphere had the courage to live the vision of economic equality, 
the governments of our dangerously divided global village might also be persuaded to legislate the sweeping changes needed. Hmm. What sort of sweeping changes in public policy would Sider like to see? He suggests for this model, the church, that it should be the norm rather than the exception for Christians to evaluate each other's income tax returns and family budgets, discuss major purchases, and gently nudge each other toward lifestyles more in keeping with their worship of a God who sides with the poor. Thus, using this as a model, a government officer can sit in on your next family budget planning session and discuss major purchases with you. He might have to bring his billy club along in case you need a gentle nudge. Actually, Ronald Sider has nothing but contempt for private charity. He would rather have state-enforced institutional change. Here are two of his reasons. First, institutional change is often more effective. The cup of cold water that we give in Christ's name is often more effective if it is given through the public health measures of preventive medicine or economic planning. Second, institutional change is often morally better. Personal charity and philanthropy still permit the rich donor to feel superior, and it makes the recipient feel inferior and dependent. Institutional changes, on the other hand, give the oppressed rights and power. Hmm. Now, if only the Lord had thought of that, but it's not too late. That morally inferior personal charity is encoded into biblical law and we're stuck with it until heaven and earth pass away. Darn. However, at least we have learned something significant about Sider's views. The power of the state, restricted by biblical law, should be aggrandized. God's law is less effective. State intervention, forbidden by Scripture, is morally better than the eternal word of God. Personal charity, which we all thought was the whole point of his book, is really just a model for the omnipotent state. And the model, morally stand, substandard as it is, will probably be scrapped once we get the state programs going full blast. There will be no less money. There will be less money for charity after taxes. The professed goal of economic equality has long been used by tyrants as a cover for the most brutal kinds of intervention. It is a fetish held up before the poor to excite envy, dangled in front of the rich to induce guilt. Revolution and statist op oppression are facilitated thereby. The envious will rebel, and the guilty will have been rendered impotent. Sider does not want the biblical idea of equality before the law, which assumes that there are distinctions among men and guarantees justice for all, and freedom to fulfill one's calling under God. Sider instead wants a state-enforced egalitarianism, a deliberate coercive policy of leveling all men to, confirm, to conform to arbitrary man-made canons of social justice. Equality before the law is incompatible with egalitarianism. The socialist doctrine of economic equality requires the stealing of property, and the prohibition of economic freedoms. It ignores the fact that the Lord makes both rich and poor, 1 Samuel 2, verse 7, and that if men desire to improve their economic standing, they must submit themselves to him, work hard, and call upon him for blessing. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. But the socialist does not humble himself. He envies. He does not work. He steals. Sider's plea for equality is in reality a grasp for power. The constantly growing demand for food must stop, or at least slow down dramatically. <coughs> That means reduced affluence in rich nations and population control everywhere. 
Rich Christians, page 214. <clears throat> we have already taken notice of several of his other goals, all to, the impl- to be implemented by the powerful state and all in the name of equality, just prices, tariffs, commodity agreements, land reform, nationalization of private industries, and in a passage quoted already, a new world economic order. In other words, equality imposed by a world government. Sider denies that he wants a wooden, legalistic, egalitarianism. We may concede that it is not wooden. It is lead bullets and steel bayonets and iron chains and concrete cells. His public policy programs are structural change, for structural change require policemen with very physical clout. If he did not intend coercion by armed thugs, he would not be pressing constantly for legislation. If he merely wants to be a moral force, he can preach, lecture, and write books. But we have seen that those activities are merely preliminary stage settings for the main event. He has stated again and again that the voluntary equalization of his followers is designed to give credibility for their demand that the state enforce equalization. And that can be done only through violence, theft, and prohibition of men's freedoms. The possessions of some are expropriated and given to others. The force of law is directed against the rich. And thus, economic equality is nothing other than legal inequality. This is not justice, it is tyranny. It is legislated lawlessness, thou shalt not steal, even by majority vote. And because it is lawless, it cannot succeed in its professed intentions. As we have seen, biblical law commands charity but only as a stopgap measure and never enforced by the state. The only way for the economy to grow is by progressively creating new capital. As labor becomes more productive through the continual investment of ever-increasing capital, real wages, that is, genuine purchasing power, for workers must rise. (coughs) This is the only method for increasing the economic status of the poor in any lasting way. Consumption of existing capital is nothing other than eating the seed corn, enjoying benefits in the present at the expense of the future. And this, as Ludwig von Mises said, is the very character of socialism. Socialism is not in the least what it pretends to be. It is not the pioneer of a better and finer world but the spoiler of what thousands of years of civilization have created. It does not build, it destroys. For destruction is the essence of it. It produces nothing. It only consumes what the social order based on private ownership in the means of production has created. Each step leading towards socialism must exhaust itself in the destruction of what already exists. The real goal of equalization, motivated as it is by envy, is thus neither equality for all men before the law, nor the genuine benefit of the poor. Notwithstanding the rhetoric, the true goal of economic equality enforced by the state is something very different indeed. As P.T. Bauer states, comprehensive planning does not augment resources. It only concentrates power. And now we know the answer to the question posed at the end of chapter 11. Ronald Sider's concern is not with the poor, not with justice, not with equality, not with growth in terms of God's law. Ronald Sider wants power. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts 
where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows, or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit reconstructionistradio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His kingdom.